Uh, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good, good. So good to see you guys. I've got the sweet privilege of preaching from the Word of God this morning. Um, and Sam said we're preaching from the parables, and, and I'm so excited to share about what I've been studying and, and kind of diving into uh, the whole summer. Um, you know, Jesus um, taught so much through the parables, and, and we got to unpack that during the preaching cohort. This is my second year being part of the preaching cohort, um, and I've preached before at Loft, but every time I come up here, it's, it's truly a joy to preach from the Word of God, uh, the Bible. And that's what the Bible means. The Bible means the book, the book, God's Word. And we sang earlier, um, we fall down, we read the scripture passage, His name is the Word of God. How wonderful is that? We get to hear God's word this morning. Um, and so as Sam said, I, pr I pray and I hope that you would hear God's voice and not my voice this morning. For those of you who are joining us for the first time or those who have missed a few gatherings, again, we've been going through a summer series through the parables. And what we get to do, um, these guys volunteered their time. They gave up family time and 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 quite honestly, some comforts to, to come on Tuesday evenings and preach. They, they dug deep into the Word of God to learn how to teach, to how to preach, uh, and study the Bible this summer. So I'm so glad to be doing that with you. Um, and as we approach my passage this morning in Luke 16, I want us to kind of be all on level footing. What I mean by this is I think I'd be naive to think that each one of us or all of us know what a parable is. A parable is a parable is basically a fictional story with an underlying truth or truths that are hidden within the story to teach a lesson. Please keep that in mind and keep this in mind. The main points of the story are clear to the Christian, those who are believers, those, as Jesus would put it, would have ears to hear. Consider that for a second. This was Jesus' specialty. He was an extremely gifted teacher. I would also argue probably the best teacher of all time in all of history. And he used parables as an expert storyteller to convey profound hidden biblical truths about God and his kingdom in a very, very masterful way. In fact, parables were used to challenge listeners to really listen because what Jesus knew about the human condition is that we're terrible listeners. Let me give you an example. Right now, I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn. He's two months old. It is a great joy to, to, to have these, these little ones in our lives right now, but we are sleep-deprived. My wife and I are sleep-deprived, and if you've been hanging out with us, you know I'm constantly saying, hey, I'm sleep-deprived, I'm sleep-deprived, getting four or five hours of sleep at night. And the interesting thing is, it really tests your limits on listening. So many times I've caught myself as we're cleaning up the living room and my wife is talking to me, I'm picking up toys, transformers, and, 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 <laughs> and, and vegetables for Hexen's like, kitchen set and, and just picking them up and she's talking to me and I'm shaking my head, yes, I hear you, I hear you, yes. And she's like, you don't, you're not, you don't hear me, you don't hear me. And I'm like, yeah, I do, yeah, I do. And she's like, what did I just say? Yes. You know, and so that's, that's kind of been my response the last two months, and I'm, no joke, that's been it. And several times she's had to be like, Ying, slow down. You're not, you're not hearing me. You need to listen. And so our thoughts, our judgments, our insecurities, and our inflated views of ourselves, babies, uh, cloud our ability to truly listen. And especially when it comes to listening to the wisdom of God. Jesus had a diverse audience of listeners, but mainly we could categorize them into two groups. Those who were hardened to hearing wisdom and truth and those who had ears to hear. Those who wanted to hear and receive the truths of God and what Jesus presented through his teaching. So this morning, my hope is that all of us would have ears to hear. Do you have ears to hear this morning? I would like to pray for us and read from Proverbs 1. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, 
and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I ask that you would do a supernatural thing and speak through me. That we would take and extract from your word what you desire for us, Lord. How you want us to listen. How you want us to obey you, as we've been saying throughout the whole service. That the posture of our hearts with Lord would be, Lord, take our hearts, let it be. God, that is what we desire. And so, as we do that this morning, God, give us ears to hear. Give us hearts that are open and soft, Lord, to your word. And Lord, would, would, we, would we come away this morning with a more fuller and beautiful picture of who you are and who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Before we begin, there are some tips that I want to give you guys this morning that's really going to help you grasp the meaning of my parable and then all the parables, actually. If you keep these in mind, you'll be, you'll be pretty set to, to understand the parables. Firstly, the most obvious things in a parable are the most important. And the most simple truths in, are the most applicable ones for the Christian. Let me say that one more time. The most obvious things in a parable are the most important, and the most simple truths are the most applicable for the Christian. And here's a little spoiler alert. All the parables, all 40 of them in the New Testament, they're all shared by Jesus, and they're all about the same thing. Because Jesus always spoke about the same thing. He was on one mission. How do we know this? Some of the passages in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark tell us. When Jesus began his ministry, both give accounts of his words. He says in Mark chapter 1, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In Matthew's account, in chapter 4, when Jesus began his ministry, Jesus says, from that time, Jesus began to preach, I mean, Matthew says, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe that Jesus is here. Repent and believe salvation has come. Repent and believe the kingdom of God is here. That was Jesus' message time and time again. It's the gospel, it's the good news, and it's the reason we're here this morning. I'll come back to this later because it's so important and I want to read our story first so that you guys would have ears to hear and you, you would hear what Jesus has to say. Turn to uh, Luke 16, verses 1 through 13, and I'm going to ask if you could stand as we behold God's word this morning out of respect. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him quickly, take your bill and sit, sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, I, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill, write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. And uh, some of the translations say mammon, which is an old word for mummy. Thank you. you. You may be seated. 
here we read about a dishonest man, and he's in charge of managing his master's estate and, and money. He is so trusted that the master leaves everything he owns under the responsibility of this man. But quickly we find out that while he's keeping account of his master's wealth, he's wasteful of it. This parable is right after the parable of the prodigal son. And it's not a coincidence. Because not only we, do we have a prodigal son, now we have a prodigal manager, a prodigal steward. And the word prodigal means wasteful. And the term manager, oikonomos, from the Greek means manager of a household, of a house, an estate, an overseer of a household affairs. Our manager is managing his master's house and estate in a wasteful way. His master finds out about this and quickly, immediately, he says, hey, close your books, finish up everything, you're done, right? And the man quickly thinks to himself, man, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm, not ashamed, and I'm too ashamed to beg. So we see that this guy's a white collar worker. And it's not that he's incapable of doing those things, it's that we gather from the text that it's his pride and ego that keep him from considering those as viable options to keep the lifestyle that he wants. So looking to secure his future because of his impending, impending unemployment, he quickly devises a strategy to get out of his mess. Our prodigal store decides to alter the debts and the accounts of those indebted to his master so that they would be indebted to him. So he goes to the one man we read, hey, you owe 100 measures of oil, make that 50. You owe 100 measures of wheat, hey, take 20% off, make it 80. And how ingenious is that? He's so careful in mismanaging his master's money, and he stealthily does so. This, this dishonest manager successfully weasels his way out of having to work for his future. He concocts a plan that will benefit him at the expense of his master and the debts of others. What's strange is later in our parable, it seems like this man's behavior is being praised in verse 8 and 9 by Jesus. Jesus goes on to say, that the man's shrewdness is actually commended by the master. And imagine that for a second. If you're the master, you basically have this guy who is mismanaging your money, and because of how clever he is, your response is, wow, this guy was pretty shrewd. He's witty. He kind of got me. <laughs> he's taken my money, and, and he's, he's got off scot-free. Kudos to him. It's so interesting. And this leads us to our main point that Jesus will reveal. This is, this is the main point of the sermon. A faithful servant of God will steward the riches given to them for eternal rewards in the kingdom of God. A faithful servant of God will steward the riches given to them for eternal rewards in the kingdom of God. And I'm going to unpack that a little bit more with three more points. These are the three points that we're going to look at this morning. Is We are called to be stewards, is point number one. We are called to be steward. Uh, we are called to steward what we have for eternity. That's point number two. And point number three is how you steward your money is a matter of worship. We are called to be stewards. We are called to steward what we have for eternity, and how you steward your money is a matter of worship. So point number one: we are called to be stewards. Remember, the most obvious things in a parable are the most important. So please let's consider this first. The parable teaches that everything we have. Literally, everything that is on earth is the Lord's. We know this because other passages in Scripture reference that. Psalm 24, 1 says this, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. The Bible kicks off with this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? He created it. David goes on to say in Chronicles, uh, 1 Chronicles 29, Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and earth is yours, is your dominion. What we have and what we own is not truly ours. We are not the owners of our money or resources here on earth. We are merely stewards of it. You and I, everyone here, everyone in this room, we are called to be responsible managers of everything we have. And you're, you're going to hear this truth come up again and again in the parables, so it's going to be really wise to put that in your back pocket. All right? And... Would you also agree with this? The world operates in a way that would rather take credit for the things they have and the successes that you accomplish. What I mean is every earthly pursuit, business owners, CEOs, bosses, YouTubers, athletes, 
uh, movie stars, entrepreneurs, even students and, and, and professionals, the list goes on. Everyone meticulously calculates their decisions for their ultimate gain. Their interests and their desires are for themselves. I'm not knocking on what you've done as a professional or as a student, like that took hard work, right? But I do want us to acknowledge that all this treasure that we have, all the wealth that we've accumulated and the successes we have, all of that is God's. And on this side of eternity, it's temporary. Another thing that I want us to consider uh, regarding this first point is if, if we realize that everything is God's, it begs us to challenge our thinking in the way we give. I really don't have time to go into this, but I, I told Sam I appreciate so much how we share about our giving that it's a matter of worship. And, and so maybe we should have taken an offering after I gave my sermon, but, <laughs> but that, that could be a whole other serving on, on, on tithing. Just, just know this, in the New Testament, it is not mandated that we tithe. It becomes more of a principle and a heart matter on how we tithe revealing how we love our Lord and devote our Lord. And we'll get, we'll get to that more, but just consider that. So our giving, our love for God, and, and how we use our money should be driven by the gospel if we say that he is Lord and everything is his, 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 his and we acknowledge that. We have to give an account of everything. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due of what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Let's also look again at the manager in verse 3. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. He neither wants to dig or beg for his living. And from the commentaries that I read, he's basically being very shallow here. And from his tone in the Greek, we see that he's full of pride. He's full of greed. It's nothing that he can't perform those tasks. In all honesty, this man, he, he's got a comfortable life. He's managing the estate of someone so rich that this rich person is not even bothered with like, managing it himself. He's like, hey, you go handle that. I got, I got bigger things to do. I got more money to go get. This meant the steward was wealthy himself. He's probably living a lavish lifestyle. Remember, he's a white collar worker. He's not blue collar. And he wanted to keep this going beyond his employment. We can gather that. This is why he's basically saying, I could never dig and I could never beg because he considers this kind of work below him. So if this is his character, we see why he doesn't mind being prodigal with someone else's money. He leeches off a comfortable living at the expense of his master. And he cares more about himself than he does about his master. And that's the worst part. He takes for granted his job and what he's been entrusted with. He's not faithful, yet in contrast, what do we know about God? God is faithful, always faithful, always gracious, and more loving than we can ever fathom. But we're like this man. Be honest, how many of us consider our jobs as a result of our skill set, our intellect, our competency, or a product of all the years we invested in school, right? Money, time, studying. How many of us pride ourselves in our ability to network and negotiate for our gain and our benefit? And dare I even say, there are parents in this room that when they look at their children, you look at your spouse and you say, man, this child is so beautiful, look what we created. Like I've heard that so many times. And not even from non-believers, just Christians. Again, God's word reminds us that he deserves all the credit. God says that all of, us, all of it, it's his. Deuteronomy verse 818 says this, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. And David emphasizes, Everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion. O Lord, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all of it. Both riches and honor come from you. You rule over them. In your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great, to strengthen everyone. It is God who gives you power, your intellect, your knowledge, your skills, your strength to obtain everything that you have. We are called to be wise stewards of everything that we have because it's not ours. And that's the first point. This is what's so obvious so far in our passage. We're called to be stewards of the money and resources God graciously allowed us to manage on earth because it belongs to him. 
If that makes sense, we can move on to our second point. Does that make sense? Do you have ears to hear? Point number two. We are called to steward what we have for eternity. We're called to steward what we have for eternity. Look at verses 8 and 9. He says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, you may they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Our Lord Jesus is hitting on something extremely important here. And if you can remember in verse 1, Jesus is again, he's addressing his disciples, the Christians. Those words... And for Christians, those words are a challenge. Jesus knows that those who are truly listening will hear these words. In verse 8, it seems like Jesus is applauding this dishonest manager um, through the reaction of the master, like the account that we see. This would have caught the attention of those really listening at that time. And this parable is unique in that it's the only one that ends this way. All the other parables end completely differently. It almost seems out of place compared to the rest of the parables. But we're good listeners, right? This morning, we hear God's voice, and we see what Jesus is saying. Let's look very closely here. Jesus is not approving the man's dishonesty or his sinful character. That would be unlike Jesus. And remember, Christ is always focused on our hearts and his kingdom. He's praising him for his shrewdness. The word for shrewd can be interchanged with wisdom. The word shrewd is derived from the word wisdom in the text. This manager is clever. Manager is clever. He's astute. He's cunning. He's intelligent about how he handled his situation. Which, if we look at the big picture, he originally got himself into anyway, right? The whole thing, it's broken, but he creates a broken solution. And it works out for him. Jesus is pointing out the reality that the sons of this world, sons and daughters, I mean, sons and daughters of this world, they are wise and sharp-witted. They have street smarts with their money. Non-believers are great at planning, investing, wisely managing their money for their gain by means of unrighteous wealth. Look at our manager. He's so cunning. As soon as he knows he's losing his job, he quickly figures out a solution that sets him up. 100 measures of oil divided in half was about three years' salary back then. And 20% of 80 measures of wheat is roughly eight years' uh, wages during that time. And some of the com commentaries that I read that mentioned that this man uh, may have either been taking his share or commission out from these deaths and removing the interest or removing the interest that is owed to his master from the, from the debtors. Either way, what he did and what Jesus commends here is his shrewdness is in preparing for his next step after being fired. <laughs> um, I lost my place, sorry. And so imagine the wisdom that he has is that he not only sets himself up for financial security, but he kind of makes himself look good too to these guys who are indebted to him. These debtors could have been businessmen, employers, wealthy individuals, of massive, because what, what's being owed is a massive amount. And our steward successfully gains their favor. Yet, in the kingdom of God, the question that we see here and the question that pops up from Jesus' words is how much more should the servants of God shrewdly manage their wealth and gifts for eternity? How much more should we be the ones who are wise with what we have and what God has entrusted with us? And the answer is, it's actually really simple, simple application. The point here is we must use all that we have for God's interest and his desires and his purposes. The world would use their money for their interests and their purposes and obtain physical rewards, but those are temporary. They'll perish. We established that in point number one. Our goal should be to invest in the spiritual imperishable things promised to us in the gospel, making eternal friendships and receiving eternal rewards. And I really want us to hear this challenge from Jesus today. We have a kingdom perspective in Christ. Our purposes and our desires should be driven by eternity. They are supposed to be propelled by the generosity of the gospel. Remember, I mentioned we'd come back to this earlier. What you and I understand and know about Jesus, what you and I understand and know about the gospel, will dictate and influence how you live out your life. 
The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins. He rose again, is eternally victorious over sin and death, so that there is now no condemnation for those who believe and cherish Christ as Lord and Savior. We're reconciled to God through Christ and now receive an everlasting joy and communion with God the Father. That's the gospel. That's the goal. That's the true eternal reward that we seek. And this is Jesus' desire for us. This is God's desire for us in Christ. And here's the bonus to all of this, that we would find this so precious, it would spur us to invest in making eternal friendships. So you say, Ing, what does that look like? What does it look like to invest in eternal friendships and the eternal rewards? It means you should be sharing the gospel and loving people to join in. It means you invest in those who preach the gospel, those who teach to preach the gospel. During the preaching cohort, we enjoyed many meals together. Thank you. <laughs> that was from y'all's giving. You invest in missionaries and those who send missionaries and plant churches. We just sent a team to Honduras last week. Many of you gave out of your need and your generosity. That was awesome. The team that went also sacrificed their finances, their comforts, their schedules, work responsibilities, family time. Those are important things, and they did that. Brother Saad just went to Rwanda, and he went with the team from Threaded. Uh, they went to go serve and equip pastors in Rwanda to plant and, 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 uh, and build up healthy churches in Rwanda and even talk about reconciliation. And we'll be soon sending a team to South Africa next month. Sam's going with a, a, a team of leaders and uh, some folks from the DLT as well uh, to, um, to visit a church planting network that we partner with called Ethnos. And, and locally, we have brothers and sisters serving in ministries here in the Metroplex who raise money and, and need financial support. Yes, prayer is important, and, and, and high fives are important, but they need financial support. And I think of Erin Templeton. She's in the room. Yeah, there she is. Kaylee Harper. These guys work with Children's Relief Inter International and are doing great work across the globe. Taylor Kirby and Jesse Litt, they're staff members of InterVarsity on the campus over here, UTD, right down the street from us, and Mandy and Shomik. I haven't met them yet, but I've heard about them, and they serve international students also at UTD. And the, list, um, the list goes on. We, we have many other ministries that we serve and, and partner with. They didn't know I was mentioning them, so they owe me a lunch. There you go. <laughs> you see here, it's not about, it's, it's really about investing in gospel enterprises, gospel pursuits, that while we're on earth, multiplies teachers and preachers, evangelists, churches that spread the word of God and bring hope and love and bring the hope and love of Christ through the gospel. And when we do this, we're purchasing friends for eternity, right? If someone comes to Christ, they're going to heaven with you. Let's not forget that. And eternity is really a long time. I know for my kids, like when I talk to Orion and I was like, hey, when you grow up, he's like, I don't want to grow up. That's going to be forever. It seems so short, but we all know for the adults in this room and some of these young college guys, time starts to go faster and faster and faster and faster. I just had dinner with uh, one of my dad's best friends, missionary and local pastor here as well. He came over last week and we had dinner together and he, he's around his 60s and he said, Ing, I'm retired, and I just, every, every day feels like the same day. It's just, it's speeding. And he doesn't even have kids. So I'm like scared. <laughs> like, oh man, if, when I get there, it's, it's going to go way faster. It's going to go light speed. We all know that there's nothing that compares to the reward in knowing Jesus. Nothing compares to having and making friends who know Jesus because we'll spend eternity worshiping Jesus together. So if the sons of this world know how to shrewdly and wisely secure their future on earth, which will pass, how much more should we Christians, the sons of light, daughters of light, wisely sword our treasure for eternity? And so I say again, do you have ears to hear? Let's get ready for the last point, because Jesus really hammers it home here. How you steward your money is a matter of worship. How you steward your money and use your money 
your resources, your time, everything is a matter of worship. Verses 10 to 13. You can listen or follow. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Did you know that Jesus spoke more about money than he did about any other topic? He spoke more about money than he did sex, heaven, and hell in the New Testament. There's something truly unique about money that we have to see here. Jesus exposes the listener's hearts. He exposes our hearts and gives us warning about money and how it clouds our devotion to him, how it clouds our devotion to God. And for a second, for a minute here, I want God's word to do the talking. So I really want you to hear God. I really want, to hear, want you to hear Jesus this morning. I'm going to take some passages. I'm going to read some passages, and I'm going to read some quotes from Jesus. In Matthew 19, 24, Jesus says, Again, I tell you, it, it, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. 1 Timothy 1.6-7 For we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of this world. And finally, Matthew 6.19-21 Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where you invest and store your treasure is where the treasure of your heart is. That's what Jesus says. Where your heart is reveals the object of your worship and who you truly worship. Who is the treasure of your heart this morning? Money or Jesus? Endless personal accumulation is meaningless. We establish that. Life is so short and you don't know how much time you have, li uh, have left. We establish that. So don't waste it. Jesus makes clear that you can't serve two masters. Verse 13 says this. And it's his main point. You'll hate one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God, and and you can't serve God while serving material, a materially secure life. It's one or the other. And where your treasure is, Jesus says that's where your heart's going to be. And this is what Jesus is saying at the end of the passage. This is, this is kind of what he's hitting home right here. He says, treasure me. Invest in my kingdom. You won't regret it because it will outlast everything this world has to offer. It will outlast everything that we desire here on this side of eternity. So church, this morning, do you have ears to hear? And remember my tip from the beginning. The most obvious things in a parable are the most important. And the most simple truths are the most applicable for the Christian. What is the greatest treasure for us this morning? Who is our reward? It's Jesus and the privilege to worship him, to know him, to have a relationship with him. If we truly understand this, we also understand that life is short and temporary. We should not invest in things that will pass away in this life. That doesn't mean that we don't enjoy the gifts God has given us, Right? doesn't mean that we don't go enjoy food and these things that we, we like to enjoy. But it does expose where our heart is at. Where's your heart? What drives you to do those things? It's about the character of our hearts. Are we self-seeking like the manager or are we being like Christ? Who quite honestly, he gave himself up for mankind. He died for our sins. 
even to the point of death on a cross. We would be shrewd and wise this morning to honor him and live in such a way that reflects this. Where your money and investments are is where you will find your heart. And as I conclude, I want to encourage you with this. In verse 10, I didn't skip it. I'm coming back to it. I thought, let me hit that last part at home and then give you this, this final application. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. Learning to be faithful in the little things helps us inevitably be faithful in much. Small incremental growth is the best way to learn how to handle much how to steward faithfully. And in doing so, the product of it will also grow our love for Christ and our love for those around us. And here's a few examples just to kind of drive the last bit home. Uh, Orsham and I have been, right now you can see, kids are just on my mind. Orsham and I have been this summer uh, laboring and working quite, uh, quite hard and teaching our kids how to enjoy memorizing scripture. And... Um, we decided Oyung's name is, the meaning of his name is from the passage we read at the very beginning, Proverbs 1-7. And it, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we said, let's just start with that passage and then kind of teach Oyung, hey, that's what your name means as well in the process. Um, and part of this, um, if I'm being really honest, was driven out of some fear uh, of, of Oyung starting the school this year. Long story short, we decided to not let him start school just because we had a lot of changes. My parents moved, my brother and sister-in-law, they all lived with us, so they moved as well. So there's just a lot of change in the house. So we decided he kind of knows how to read, he kind of knows his ABCs and, and one, two, threes and all that stuff. So no stress, he doesn't have to go to pre-K, but at least we'll, we'll, we'll do some Bible reading and, and some scripture and teach him that. Because when I came to the US, I got kind of thrust into the American public school system. I didn't know English. Um, I was probably a weird kid. I, I don't remember, but I, I, got a, I received a lot of bullying. Um, and then on top of that, not being able to articulate to teachers like what was going on, it was, it was very, very difficult. Uh, but what I did have was God's word. And it's still like basic things that my father and mother taught me. So I kind of drew from that wisdom and I said, hey, if my kids go to school, they're going to have so many things come at them. I don't want them to hear just my voice, but I want them to hear the Lord's voice. So we're going to memorize scripture. And so it's been really hard. It took, it took about three months. And, but he learned it. So now if you ask Oryung, hey, Oryung, say Proverbs 1-7. He'll say it real fast. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Like, he'll just say it. Like, boom. Uh, the funny thing is Hexen learned it before he did. And she's two. So now she just walks around, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. She'll do that. And what Orsham and I learned and what God's grace has been is that they're babies. And they were able to keep God's word in their heart. I also want to talk about a young man that I've been able to disciple for the last couple of years. His name is Ben Matthews. I'm going to hit on babies, I'm going to hit on teenagers, and I'm going to hit on adults here for this last bit. Ben Matthews, he's right there. Hey, Ben. So I asked him if I could use him in my sermon. He just graduated from college, I mean, from high school, and he's 18. Uh, ben came, uh, he was, came out of the Catholic Church, and, and uh, long story short, I, I get, I get the sweet, sweet opportunity to work with refugees the last seven-ish years, and they're the ones that actually, like, shared the gospel to Ben. He came to Bible study, actually, uh, after a funeral <laughs> of uh, one of our dear friends and uh, the older sister of one of the boys that, um, that is, that's in that group, and Ben came to Bible study, and then afterwards, he's like, Co they all call me coach. Coach, I've never heard the gospel before. I've never heard the gospel before, but I'm hearing it from you, and there's something so different, and so fast forward, the last two years have just been amazing. Ben has been devouring God's word, um, learning to hate sin in his life because it's for his good. Um, and, and now he wants to make disciples. Like he desires that. So the kind of situation that I want to highlight here is he was graduating high school. We spent the whole year talking about, hey, where are you going to go to college, right? high school things, senior, senior year kind of things. And he decided that he was going to go to Texas State Technical College to learn uh, to be a mechanic. And it's, it's close to A&M, so it's quite out there. And so we were actually, start, we started researching churches and praying about, Lord, would you just, would you bring a body of believers around Ben? Would you uh, 
show him uh, wisdom on where to go to church and how to get plugged in and let him not, not miss a step in his growth. So we prayed, we prayed, and he was set. He was going to go to Texas State Technical College. He's accepted. He's got it all set. And then literally right, right towards the end of the summer, he comes up to me one Bible study. He goes, hey, coach, I decided I'm going to stay in Dallas. I said, what? Because that was not the conversation that we had. I'm going to stay in Dallas. So I said, yeah, sure. Why? I was excited, right? <laughs> and he, he goes, I feel like I'm growing. I, I'm loving Jesus more. And I, I love the community that I'm plugged into right now. And it's not like I, Dallas doesn't have all the resources to learn to be a mechanic, right? So we said, all right, that's awesome. Let's pray. And God has been so gracious. God gave him a job at a Ford dealership as a mechanic, and he's going to school. And he wants to learn how to preach. He wants to learn how to teach the Bible. And it's just been such an awesome privilege for me to be able to disciple him. And lastly, I want to hit on uh, a brother that goes to this church. His name is Jairus. You guys have seen him up here lead worship with me. Jairus had a unique opportunity this summer to go and serve at a church, a huge church, a Baptist church in uh, Allen, Texas, far north from us, Cottonweed Creek Church. This church has all the resources, guys. Just if you go to the church, they've got production team, everything. So for a musician, you're just like, yes. Right? And as the worship pastor, I was like, dude, that, that place is awesome. And their, their worship leader, uh, Bridget, and her team, they're just phenomenal people, just sweet, loving people. I got to meet them. We got to do some training with them with our, with our audio team and, and worship team leaders recently. And they're just so sweet people. And they, all summer, were just enticing Jairus, like, hey, we're going to give you this salary. You get to, like, come and work here. Just beautiful things which are great. He's going to go do kingdom work there. So he, they said, hey, would you do an internship with us? He agreed, and he goes, and he does it. And Jairus and I, we, we meet weekly for breakfast on Mondays after prayer. And, and so we're talking, we're talking. So what happened was throughout the summer, his excitement slowly dwindled, dwindled, dwindled. And finally I asked him, bro, what's wrong? You don't seem excited about this whole thing. He's like, man, I should be excited. Like, if I'm talking from, like, a worldly perspective, I'm with, like, musicians. It's like, they're better than me. I can learn so much. I have all the equipment that I need, like, at my disposable. I have a, a professional audio team, video team, everything. And it just, I'm not, I feel like God is telling me to actually leave all that and continue to serve at Lofts. How awesome is that? I said, Jairus, why, 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 how'd you come to that conclusion? Dude, I feel like we're making disciples. I'm seeing people grow in the word. And if I left, that would be so inconsiderate, irresponsible of me to do that because God is evidently working through me at Loft. I said, that's wisdom right there. You're making eternal friends. Not that he can't do that there. They're sweet people. We're going to do more stuff with them, I, I, I hope, in the future. I've been talking with Bridget, but... He sees that, and he sees where God wants him to be, not where he wants to be. It's a matter of the heart. And the simple thing here is for the abiding Christian to, faithful, to be faithful in cultivating a relationship with Jesus. It's the little things that add up in our faith. Reading God's word daily, praying time and time again, day after day, studying deeper, longer, praying deeper, longer, and before you know it, everything begins to change. The way you live out your life changes. The way you manage and handle your finances, your relationships, your time begins to change. Because it's not your desire, it becomes God's desire. The Holy Spirit uses those little moments to mature Christ-likeness in you. And through the power of the gospel, he fastens your heart to Jesus. Clinging to Jesus becomes more instinctual and it's not a chore anymore. It's not something that you have to do or a checkbox. You begin to truly treasure Jesus. And the beautiful thing is, in the process of falling more in love with Jesus, you, you begin to hate sin, you grow, become more like him, um, you begin to treasure and desire to share the gospel more and make disciples, love others as Christ calls us. God receives all the glory because our hearts are now motivated by him and not treasure. You know, and God designed us to function this way. He made us to be motivated by what we love. And he desires that we wholeheartedly love him. 
The old hymn, Be Thou My Vision, gives us the cure for helping us fix our, the eyes of our hearts on what matters most in life and the next. Let's remember these words. It says, Riches I heed not, no man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure, thou who art. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For Christ has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. I'm going to pray for us now and we'll transition into communion. The music team is going to come up um, behind me here in a little bit and we'll take time to reflect and remember what Christ has done for us um, through his life, his death, and his resurrection. We'll take time to consider his teaching from our parable this morning. And I want to encourage you, some of us need confession. Sam said it earlier, some of us need to respond with repentance this morning. Maybe you need to place your trust in Jesus Christ this morning. Some of us need prayer. We're going to have folks in the back. If you need prayer, they're, they're ready to pray with you. And if this is new to you, if all of this is new to you, the gospel, all these Christian words and the, the lingo, if all of this is new to you but you're so curious, I just want to encourage you, the Holy Spirit is working. And don't leave this place without asking or sharing what's on your heart with somebody. You can come to me, come to Sam, one of the leaders. But don't be afraid to ask. And then there's some of us who are rejoicing in what God is doing in our lives because we get it. We're, we're in the zone. However you respond this morning, take time to listen. Have ears to hear. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful for you and how you still speak to us 2,000 years after your death to know that you are alive on the throne, interceding and pleading for our sake when we pray. God, give us hearts this morning that would hear your voice, that would remove anything, any riches, any treasure, any worldly promise that clouds our love and devotion to you, Jesus. Help us to see you more truly, more, more, more uh, clearly, God. Remove anything in our hearts, any walls that would keep us from loving you. As we sang earlier, Lord, take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. doesn't matter if we're rich or poor. That doesn't matter, Lord. You're after our hearts. You're running after our hearts. And you desire for our hearts to be wholeheartedly in love with you. So as we take of the bread, as we drink this morning, help us to cherish that. Holy Spirit, help us to grow in love for what you've done in Christ for God's glory, for his honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.